Hi, everyone. Welcome to the 2021 Lunch and Learn series hosted by Friends of Birmingham Botanical Gardens. Um, we, we do this all in partnership with the Alabama Cooperative Extension System, the Alabama Green Industry Training Center, the Jefferson County Department of Health, Jefferson County Commission, City of Leeds, Alabama, the City of Birmingham Stormwater Management, and the Stormwater Management Authority Incorporated. And today, um, we're going to have our presentation by Trevor Mann, and he's going to be introduced by Tyler Mason with the Alabama Cooperative Extension System. Thank you very much. My name is Tyler Mason. I'm with Alabama Extension. Just wanted to um, invite people that um, as they have questions today for Trevor, that they can type those in the chat box and we will um, uh, address those to Trevor at the end of his presentation. And I also wanted to invite people to submit questions that they may have after this presentation about plants or landscapes or ecosystems to the Alabama Extension Service. You can reach us via email or telephone um, and, and we can address questions that you may have or do site visits. Um, my specialty is in urban agriculture and natural resources, but we also have people with experience in, in home grounds. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Trevor Mann. Hey everyone. Like, the, like the ecological systems he mimics in his permaculture design is a shifting mosaic. Trevor grew up in Hoover, Alabama, uh, just miles from the land that uh, would later become Walden Pharmacy. Always a little different in his thinking, Trevor knew the conventional path wasn't for him, so he began saving for a cross-country road trip after high school. His travels shifted him and opened his eyes to the greater possibilities in life. And after returning from his trip, Trevor pursued a spiritual path with the general idea that he was here to bring healing to the earth. When a friend introduced Trevor to permaculture, um, a passion ignited in him, and that would later become his career and his uh, lifelong passion. After meeting his partner, Joanna, and pursuing a market gardening for a year, um, an auspicious mushroom find yet again shifted Trevor's focus to growing herbs. Trevor received permaculture design training from Cliff Davis and Jennifer Albanansis at Spiral Ridge Permaculture in 2015. And he studied herbalism with Phyllis Light in 2019. Trevor is the co-owner of Walden Pharmacy along with his, his partner and wife, Joanna. Walden Pharmacy is a family owned and run small scale permaculture style herb farm located in Bessemer, Alabama. And at Walden Farms, they grow wild uh, craft, small batch, sustainable herbal medicines with families in mind, with the philosophy that each person possesses the capacity to heal themselves. They offer support, guidance, and medicines made from the earth that allow one to, to move back into balance of mind, body, and spirit. And you can find them at Pepper Place Market every Saturday. Trevor is also the owner of Walden Foodscapes, which is an ecological land design and install service that uses permaculture design principles and focuses on edible plantings so that you can transform your land problems into edible solutions with Walden Foodscapes. Uh, without further ado, here is Trevor Mann. Hey everyone, thanks so much, Tyler. Thanks for having me, everybody. Thanks for being here. Um, all right, so we're going to get to some of the really cool gardening details later on in the presentation, but first I'd like to set up a few things. Um, I've got a few goals. My, I hope everybody has a basic understanding of permaculture by the end of this. And I want to empower every single person here uh, to be able to set up their own permaculture or ecological garden. Um, and another thing I wanna set up is the idea that we are a keystone species and what that means is uh, any species in an ecosystem whose patterns and behavior affect all other species is what a keystone species is. And that there's this whole mindset of sustainability being that um, the best that we can do is not affect anything, right? Uh, we really need to shift that because that's a negative self image and see that we have the capacity to do positive things and be 
play an ecological role. Um, yeah, so let's get started on this key to your landscape presentation. I'm gonna share my screen here. Trevor, can you speak up just a little bit louder? Yeah, let me uh, share my screen. There it is, there we go. Sorry, having technical difficulties here. The computer's loading. Am I still on? Yeah, there we are. All right. Sorry. Do you know where the share screen button is? Thought I hit it. Well, this is awkward. <laughs> Sorry. Should be in the garden right now. Dawn, is uh, Trevor a co-host? He is a co-host and share screen is at um, the bottom. Yeah. When you go down to where your mute and start video is, you should see like a yep. little green thing. And when you hit share screen, you're gonna select what screen you want and then click share on the bottom of that box. Yeah, there it goes. But nothing has popped up yet, so. Yeah, I figured this out. Trevor, do you have your presentation pulled up? Yeah, it's up. It's up right here. Okay. Really sorry, everybody. Are oh, you that's on okay. a Mac? Uh, yeah. Okay, so sometimes Macs have a weird presentation setting where when you're sharing your presentation, you can't see it on your screen or something like that. And I think that might be what's happening. And I can't explain how to fix that from here. Okay. All right. Because like right now what's on the screen is your, yeah, is you. All right. Uh, well. So if I were, um, go down, click, unshare your screen. I'm going to stop your sharing. Okay. So now when you go to share screen, when that window pops up, select the one that has your presentation. Ah. There's a password. Should, uh... What's the password? For sharing screen? Uh, it's, it's telling me I have, to, I have to use a password. That is ridiculous. Oh, it's showing up now. I see your screen. Oh, cool. Okay. All right. So sorry, everybody. That was really awkward. Um, I'm glad we got the awkwardness out of the way. 
<laughs> so y'all can see me now. Y'all can see the screen? Yes. Okay. Woo! <laughs> all right, thank you. All right, so, all right. Did everything presented uh, the uh, beginning part. All right, so eat your landscape. All right, thanks so much. All right, appreciate y'all. All right, we're gonna be talking about permaculture today. Uh, permaculture is my passion. Uh, the word permaculture you can see there is permanent agriculture or permanent culture. And it's the idea that we can mimic the patterns and relationships uh, in nature uh, to co-create ecological human settlements. Um, the best way I've heard permaculture described is applied ecology, uh, but the, here's a Bill Mollison's definition. Uh, permaculture is the conscious design and maintenance of agroproductive ecosystems, which have the diversity, stability, and resilience of natural ecosystems. It is the harmonious integration of landscape and people providing for their food, energy, shelter, and other material and non-material needs in a sustainable way. Permaculture design is a system of assembling conceptual and material and strategic components and a pattern which functions to benefit life in all its forms. The philosophy behind permaculture is one of working with rather than against nature, of thoughtful observation rather than thoughtless action, of looking at systems and all their functions rather than only asking only one yield of them and allowing systems to demonstrate their own evolution. And that was Bill Mollison. Uh, permaculture has three ethics, uh, care for the earth, care for people, and fair share. There's 12 principles of permaculture. Uh, Observe, observe and interact, catch and store energy, obtain a yield, apply self-regulation and accept feedback, use and value renewable resources, produce new ways and patterns to details, integrate rather than segregate, use small and slow solutions, use and value diversity, use edges and value to marginal, and creatively use and respond to change. I was using that last one there, uh, maybe not so creatively, but anyway, uh, all right, so I'm going to go over the design process just a little bit, because um, I think it's important to set up uh, just a few things. So this is the zones of use, how you set up your farm or your homestead or even just your garden practically. Um, and you set like zone one is where things are that um, Oh, yes, right there. Uh, areas needing continual observation. Uh, so you can do like a kitchen garden there. You can do some nursery work. You can do herb gardens. Um, and zone two would be like crop gardens and edible forest gardens. Maybe you have your chickens or if you have goats, you can have them around that area. Um, there's orchards and edible forest gardens and silvopasture in zone three. Zone four would be something like nut trees or some fruit trees. And then zone five is where you sit and observe nature. And uh, all these are dependent upon your land base. Not everyone's gonna have that amount of land base, but it's just the idea to get it going. And um, everybody can have a zone five in like a public park just to observe the patterns in nature. All right, and sectors, uh, you see this picture here, you draw uh, your, your house or wherever your living space is. And then you've got these different um, shapes for like, hey, this is the sun sector, this is a shade sector, this is maybe a neighbor dog sector. Uh, so uh, creatively using and responding uh, to potential threats to your property there with the, the neighbor's dog. Um, so yeah, that's sectors. There's a scale of permanence. So things that are harder to change at the top all the way down to the easiest things to change at the bottom. So there's climate, landform, water, access, structure, fencing, vegetation, and soil. Uh, the first thing that you can affect here really is the water. And we're gonna be talking more about that a little bit later, but uh, you can do little earth shaping things to slow spread and sink water. And then everything else below that uh, comes successively. So it's like your access comes after you've shaped the earth and then you that earth shaping becomes your planting zones. So now you're, you need access to your plantings and then fencing can go on the other side if you wanna do that. And then, yeah. 
So stacking functions is a big part of permaculture. Uh, every element should have multiple functions. Uh, so this is an example right here. Um, this is our barn for our goats and our ducks. And at the top there, that angle piece, um, there's a, a hayloft. You can see to the right, we have a, a gutter that leads to a rain tank. Uh, obviously, I'm leaning tools up against that. And we're milking in there as well. Keep me dry during the uh, during milking. So functional interconnection. So every single element needs to be connected to other elements in some way. There needs to be some relationship. And uh, so right here, what this is, this long looks like a ditch, and then there's a berm. That's called a swale. And what's happening here is to the the right of this picture is where our barn and our chicken coop is, our chicken composting system, and water, rainwater will wash through these systems. It will catch into the swale and it will slow spread and then it will sink it into the ground. And you can see to the left, I've got edible forest gardening going on right there. And then further on to the left, there's our crop garden. Um, which is all being irrigated and fertilized by this little swale or big swale. All right. So edible forest gardening, uh, this is a big thing for indigenous cultures around the world. This is a lot of, um, there's a, a lot of remnants of edible forest gardening from indigenous cultures that of course have been going on propagating for since they started them. Um, there's evidence that the Amazon rainforest is an edible forest garden, that a lot of the United States was an edible forest garden. Uh, it's really fascinating. Um, you can find more info about that on, on, on the internet. Um, so yeah, they mimic the patterns of ecological succession. Uh, so the top right picture, that's what succession is. Uh, Farthest to, to the right, there's grass. And then it, say, um, say we're standing in the field and we kind of zoom uh, time forward uh, and we just watch things grow, right? So we'll go from grass, and then you'll start seeing shrubs come in, some brambles, some small trees will come in, some the pioneer species of trees, and then eventually it will get to the canopy forest. Um, so that's the pattern that we're mimicking in edible forest gardening. But we're picking species that uh, we either know or we're experimenting with to figure out if they can create an ecosystem. And uh, it's like your conductor and you're picking the pieces and all their relationships create this symphony, um, create a symphony of life. Um, so multiple species of plants working together uh, is called a guild. Uh, there's some common guilds that people know about, which are like corn, bean, and squash. Uh, there would be sunflower in that guild as well. Um, let's see, there's a, you can pretty much just, you pick all these different species here, um, all these different niches in this, uh, and a forest ecosystem. So you're trying to pick like a canopy tree. You want some nitrogen fixing plants in there. You have some shrubs to go around it, maybe some brambles. Um, and then tubers, you've got mushrooms, uh, vines and ground covers. Um, yeah, and you can create a forest garden for pretty much any climate or microclimate. Um, so how the indigenous cultures um, would, would manage these things is uh, they did something called Swidden agriculture, which is slash and burn. And they would have this huge area that is the, the forest there in the Americas, the American chestnut was their canopy hey. and uh, down species. Hey, but, Trevor. Yeah. So I'm noticing from looking at your screen and also from the chat that people aren't able to read what's on your slides. So they oh. suggested turning off your video. 
at the bottom and that might help how's that is that better uh it looks a little better on my end yes but it, it's going in and out um just so everyone does know we're recording this and we're also going to have a digital um copy in pdf form of his presentation that y'all can go back and look at but i think okay. this should work a little bit better thank you trevor yeah thank y'all um all right so the the american chestnut was the native americans uh, keystone species that was one of their main food crops um but so what they would do is they would take an area of maybe an acre or more and they would chop it down and burn it um that's like swidden agriculture and they would grow their their crops in the middle there and then they'd also let succession to happen and they would you know select succession and on the edges there would be the brambles coming up and everything the herbaceous plants would be uh, starting to fill those niches and it would bring deer and other things that they could then uh, take and uh, uh, eat and there's this whole intricate system it's pretty pretty amazing and I I know I'm probably not doing it justice here um, but just just mentioning it um, so that, that's a shifting mosaic that they would mimic. Uh, yeah, let's see, let's go to the next one. All right, so these are a couple of gardens that I've done. Uh, the one on the left, that is a food hedge or a fedge. Uh, there's not a ton of plants that you can see right there. There are a lot of small ones. I was doing this for a friend, so we'd used a lot of uh, cuttings uh, just from our gardens. Um, so this is a food hedge right here, um, just keeping it short. And then these are swales. And I actually put wood under there, which I'll talk about in just a few minutes, uh, underneath the back side of the swale. Um, and then on the right, the tall tree in the very back is a black walnut tree. And this one right here is a pear. I've got herbaceous, like Queen Anne's lace. There's some valerian in there. Um, there's uh, aromatic pest confusers like garlic and lemon balm to bring their ecosystem function uh, by preventing a lot of pests. The uh, the Queen Anne's lace in there is a um, umbelliferous flower, umbrella shaped flower, which brings parasitic wasps, which will lay eggs on any caterpillars that uh, might be uh, predating this guild here. I've got shrubs to the south, which are um, gumi berry, which is a nitrogen fixing berry that's a nutri nutraceutical quality. It's really astringent, so I, I just use them in a smoothie. Uh, and then there's a Nanking cherry right in here, which is a, a bush cherry that thrives here in Alabama, which is amazing. Um, and I'll note here that the black walnut, this, this guild is further away from the drip line of the black walnut, so it's not going to get the jug lungs. But there are species that work with the black walnut. Um, and another thing is, you see this is, the black walnut is to the north. And then I've got this smaller tree uh, to the south of that, so it's still getting its sunlight. Then I've got the shrubs just to the south of this tree right here. And then I've got herbaceous kind of growing everywhere. Uh, there's a passion flower vine and muscadine growing in the background. So this whole, all these things are happening all at once on this, in this space. Here's some kitchen garden ideas. Um, top right corner, this is the beginnings of a keyhole. Or, I'm sorry, herb spiral. I was looking at the other one. Uh, herb spiral. So the top, uh, the center is taller. So ergonomically, you can stand on the side and reach to the center, and then 
yeah and it looks really cool and then this is it planted and has compost in there and everything and then to the left um, there's our kitchen garden so this spot is in zone one for us what, like i said earlier is um, spaces that you see the most and uh, you're going to be tending to those gardens because you see like hey there's a weed or there's uh, something I need to attend to. Uh, so this is at the bottom of our driveway. Um, I've got a herb spiral out of bricks and then some circle gardens around that. And this area down here, you see where the water is at the bottom of the picture. Uh, so there's a saying in permaculture, the problem is the solution. Uh, so we were having washout in these gardens and all of our mulch. So what I did was I took this little path that's just off contour so I can walk the water away from the garden. And I planted it out with all perennial herbs and turned the problem into a solution. And now it's a, it connects to a rice paddy off to the right. And before it spills off over here, um, if you can see my cursor, uh, it back floods this thing to water this garden. So there's some trickery you can do with, with water to uh, use water and, uh, you know, water is life. So uh, here are some keyhole beds. Um, this is something I did for somebody in Roebuck Springs. Uh, you can see to the right, uh, there's a little path that goes to the center of the bed and then you can sit there and have access to the whole bed around you. And there's a little wire ring right here. That's a compost ring. So my client was putting her chicken litter and her food scraps in there and earthworms in the garden are now eating and going in there and then coming back out and going around. Uh, it's a nice food source and uh, simple nutrient. So um, a roost stout bed, uh, this is one of my favorite gardening te techniques. Uh, we have an area on our farm that does not get access to water uh, other than the, the swales. So what we've done is um, we've, in the fall, you lay down thick hay, like a, a foot to two feet thick. And then in the spring, you can plant it out and it'll be, um, it'll have a whole bunch of moisture underneath there and you'll never really have to water them. And uh, potatoes in particular do really well. Like you can take your seed potato and just stick it in the hay at the bottom of the hay and it will grow up. And when you're ready to harvest it, you just move the mulch away and pick up potatoes off the ground. It's awesome. All right. This is another one of my favorite techniques. This is called hoopaculture. Uh, it's a technique that came out in the wet areas of Germany. Uh, so you bury logs and they act like a sponge absorbing and releasing water as needed. They'll break down over 20 to 30 years and turn into nice humus. Um, and they mimic a nurse log in nature. So you can see the, the graphic of the breakdown in the middle. And on the right, this is one of our big hugoculture mounds we've made. It's probably four feet long by five feet wide. And this is in the middle of our uh, crop garden, our annual crop garden. And we've planted an edible forest garden on there. And you've got all the ecosystem services of all the different species of plants working together on this garden bed in the middle of our garden. Uh, we're going to keep it short to keep uh, light access to the annuals, but this structure in the middle of the garden will provide habitat to predatory predatory species, and you know prevent a lot more of like flea beetles and whatever cabbage uh, worm moths whatever uh, eating your crops. Uh, so. Integrating animals into your planting system is, is one of the quickest ways to build fertility in your growing system. Um, you can't have an ecosystem without animals. So, you know, mimicking that pattern and 
using them to, to create ecological disturbance. Uh, when you have a disturbance, it, uh, you can, you know, a, a plant right behind them. Um, so we have chicken tractors. Um, so chickens will be in this uh, small enclosure and um, I'll have them on a spot in, a gar in the garden that might have some weeds in there. They'll eat up all the weeds, which will make them really healthy. They'll poop and then scratch all the ground and then I'll move them and then I can plant stuff right behind them. Uh, that was the only way we could really get squash because we used to have a big squash bug problem. Um, this right here, what you're seeing is our chicken composting system. Um, so what I do is uh, every week we cycle in the bedding from the ducks and the goats, which is to the barn to the left. And we add it to the bedding of the chickens and we turn these piles down the hill and we're using, you know, force of nature. We're using gravity to help us turn. And that will be finished by the time it gets down to the bottom of the chicken run there. And it'll be really close to where I can take it into the garden and the nursery. Uh, so just a really functional piece here. Yes, uh, growing medicine and making medicine is incredibly empowering. It's super easy to do. Um, uh, medicinal are also benefit from growing in polycultures. So slight stress uh, in their growing condition allows them to put on more medicinal compounds. Um, yeah, and uh, just look up the folk method for making a tincture and uh, figure out some medicinal plants around you because 80% of the plants around us are medicinal. I just kind of pulled that number out of nowhere, but it's, it's a guess. There's so many medicinal plants around us at all times. Uh, it's incredible. All right, so fertility. Um, you can do something called compost tea. You can do it on a small scale with a, a five gallon bucket and you can get a, an aerator from the pet supply store and then get finished compost and put it in a, like a paint strainer bag and hang it in there and put the air, um, the bubbler in there and put some molasses in there, which will feed the microbes. And in the summertime, in like 12 hours, you'll start to see some foam. That's how you know it's starting to get good. Uh, so that's a really easy way to bring fertility. Um, so there's anaerobic compost tea, which anaerobic compost tea, uh, you, take bucket, uh, you fill that bucket up with your weeds. Uh, I really like to use comfrey because it's really high in minerals and nutrients. Uh, there's also like uh, dock and nettle, which are really good as well. So you fill them up uh, and then you put a brick on it. And then you put rainwater over that and you close the lid. You don't want mosquitoes in there. Uh, and then you let that sit for like a month uh, in the warm season. And, you know, you can take that off and water your garden with it. It's a little bit smelly. It smells anaerobic, uh, but it's really high in nutrients. Um, of course, there's compost and animals, uh, cover crops, chop and drop, which is uh, chopping you know, you can intentionally grow um, biomass plants like comfrey or catalpa tree or um, nitrogen fixing trees. Um, and you can chop them down and then mulch with them. And that'll allow other plants to, to eat them essentially. And it also, as above, so below, it'll also prune their roots. Um, and with nitrogen fixing plants, It'll prune the roots, and then that that relationship that that plant has with the nitrogen fixing bacteria will release and then decompose. Um, some like trees will take about six years to start decomposing or to decompose completely, but it will be a slow release nitrogen. Uh, and then biomass plants. All right, I mentioned catalpa earlier, but this is a really cool thing about catalpa. It is a legume, but it is not a nitrogen fixer. But what it does is it's a, it, it has the worms, you know, you can use for fishing bait, but the worms will eat the leaves of the tree and then it'll, they'll be pooping all underneath the tree. 
So you'll have this incredible source of fertility. Uh, and then the birds too will be congregating there and pooping them out. All right, soils, all right. Uh, soil is a giant organism that is 100% mouth. Uh, it's important to keep your soil covered at all times to protect it from the sun and the rain uh, and compaction. Organic matter covering the surface of the soil uh, is a constant food source as well as protects it from the elements. Um, I really like wood chips as a form of mulch. Um, there is some controversy of wood chips locking up nitrogen but you just don't mix it in with the soil. You just keep it on the top and that will allow for a fungal dominant soil, which is really good uh, on many levels. Uh, and uh, if you're interested in learning more about soil, um, Dr. Elaine Ingham, uh, you can look her up. She's the guru of soil. And then uh, there's a book called Teeming with Microbes. All right. Gardening with mushrooms. Um, King Stropharia is by far my favorite mushroom to work with. Uh, it's an edible that grows in many types of mulch and creates a mycorrhizal connection with most vegetables. It does not do it with uh, cruciferous vegetable, vegetables. <laughs> uh, so mycorrhizal fungi attach to the roots of plants and act as an extension of the root system. They, uh, from this, Inter interconnected network, plants can share nutrients and warn of pests, among other things. Um, there's some really cool studies about that. You can uh, do some YouTubing or searching about that. Um, so this picture, these pictures are of King Stropharia mushrooms. Uh, we have them kind of growing everywhere on our property now. Uh, and you see the the mushroom right there on the, the left picture is about as big as my head. <laughs> uh, so every inch uh, in depth of mulch that they're growing on is about an inch in diameter that the mushroom can get. It's pretty, pretty cool. And uh, I like, to, I'm gonna be doing some experiments with that here. Uh, all right, so habitat creation. This is where the edge effect really shines. Uh, the edge of ecosystems is the most biodiverse place because you get clashing ecosystems there. Um, so you wanna create as much edge as possible um, in your garden and in your landscape, uh, uh, creating small ponds, vernal pools, uh, plants for habitat, uh, umbrella flowers, stacks of rocks, which are lizard habitat, um, are very beneficial. Okay, y'all. So this is just a little thing. Um, so I just kind of threw this together. This might not work exactly, but it's, it's just an idea of like, okay, so we can have a water cistern uh, uh, that is, that has a trellis and you could grow hardy kiwi over your water cistern, um, or you could do um, a pond by the garden, et cetera. You know, so it's it's just a way of starting to think about your relationships of the elements in your um, in your landscape and how they can function together. Um, one thing on here I didn't mention I would like to talk about is the uh, vernal pools. Um, so we have a few of those on our property It's where you almost like you're digging a pond, but it's not going to hold water. Uh, but for a couple of days, but that makes a really great habitat for frogs and on our property, uh, during the early spring, it is loud. You cannot talk, you can't have a conversation outside because of how many frogs we have on our property. Pretty, pretty cool. All right, that's the whole thing. Okay. So we have a couple of questions in the chat. Let me just make it back up. So 
that was about the video, which we fixed. Um, when you install the garden, what do you anticipate the ultimate height to be? You have the walnut tree, for example, should it be prone to always be human height for access? And that, and that one right there, no. Um, walnuts will fall to the ground when. Uh, it depends on the circumstance. So you could have an edible forest garden where your canopy is a shrub. It doesn't have to be a nut tree or even a like a pear tree. It can be a shrub. Um, so it's just about um, you know how can we work with those patterns and make it fit our context with our land base and our soil and yeah school tomatoes do well with the roof stout method never tried tomatoes but it is a deep mulch method and it's going to benefit from the deep mulch and uh, that would prevent um, you know, sp splashing mud from making the, tr the tomato have disease. You just have to move the mulch away and plant it into the ground. I wouldn't plant the root ball into the, the hay. What is the easiest way to get started with perma permaculture um, or edible gardens? Yeah, so good question. Um, first, just start tinkering. Um, for me, I uh, started learning about permaculture and I was reading books. Um, one really good book is Gaia's Garden by Toby Hemingway. Uh, so that's a, that's a great book to, uh, to read. Um, for me, you know, I, it took about six months of studying on my own before I took a permaculture design course, uh, like uh, which was mentioned in my intro. Um, and in that permaculture design course, that really shifted my perception because uh, all these different elements that, you know, I'm, I'm sharing with you all these different elements, but taking a permaculture design course may, you know, make some mash and really just perception of at least it shifted my perception of everything of my interaction with with nature is king safaria edible do you grow others like lion's mane it is edible um it's best eaten in the button stage the big one that i had there would be pretty bitter um, it would still be edible, but it's not the best. Um, it's also medicinal. Um, we do have lion's mane. I have grown some logs of lion's mane and shiitake. And uh, I, I think that's it as far as ones we've grown. But um, we have a big lion's mane brooding every year on our property uh, because uh, our neighbor was getting a tree taken down. And I, I wanted to get some of the logs uh, just the branches, you know, because I wanted to do some mushroom inoculation. So I asked the tree service to come and drop some for me. And I went inside and I came back outside. And there was a huge trunk in our front yard. I was like, oh, no. <laughs> uh, so that just sat there because I couldn't move it. And then in the fall, sometime in the winter, uh, I saw some oyster mushrooms on it. Yes, score. Uh, so I went, I started harvesting the oyster mushrooms and I walk around the side of the log. There's this giant lion's mane on it. Whoa. And uh, every year since then, it's been like four years, we've gotten a huge lion's mane mushroom out of that. Where do you get the rocks for keyhole gardens? Um, I bought those from a, uh, Wholesale Stone Supply, Alabama, uh, Alabama Wholesale Stone, shout out. How close can you plant another fruit tree near a walnut tree? Question. Um, so you want to avoid the drip line. So 
you see like this would be the edge of the walnut tree right here with the edge of the leaves and you've got uh, water that's dripping off of that uh, from the rain you want to avoid that area but there are fruit trees that grow well and have evolved to grow underneath walnut trees um, on our property where the walnut tree is um, a few years back we had an excavator to do all the earthworks on the property i also cleared a whole lot of privet and some of which was underneath that walnut tree and i'm with that area i'm kind of just letting it evolve uh, and selecting things it's called selected succession uh, when you just let it grow and then you pick these species to live and which ones to chop and drop um, what i'm seeing is i've got the walnut tree and i've got a whole bunch of american persimmon coming up underneath that i've got some pawpaw just volunteering underneath that um, and yeah mulberries under there um, yeah so there there is a guild that would be specific for the black walnut tree is it hay or straw why is hay better um hay um i mean it's, there's not i don't think either one is better um i just have somebody close to me here in bessemer that has organic hay so yeah but i use hay so Are there any books or other resources for edible landscaping in Alabama or the South? Yeah. Um, Sorry. Are there any books or other resources for edible landscaping in Alabama or the Southeast? And are there any good guides for wild edibles in Alabama or the Southeast? Yes. Uh, good question. So that Gaia's Garden book is a great one to start with. Um, it's for temperate climate permaculture. Um, and then there's a shift because I'm using this book right here as a uh, computer stand. This is a, you really want to get nerdy on this, on Edible Forest Gardens. Um, Edible Forest Gardens by Dave Jackie and Eric Tonsmeyer. I mean, it's a thick textbook and there are two of these. Um, but Guy's Garden. And if y'all want to hear more about permaculture, um, there's a there's a movie called Inhabit, a permaculture perspective. Uh, you can uh, just go to inhabitfilm.com and rent the documentary for five bucks. It is such a good documentary. They've done a wonderful job. And it's, it's just a gives you a basic understanding of a lot of different elements in permaculture. Is it a good idea to clear out fallen trees and debris around a vernal pool? Should new plants be introduced? I mean, you could leave them. Um, nobody would do that in the woods. Uh, you could let it be a nurse log, or you could use it as a hoga culture. Like you could, uh, you know, dig out an area and then put the log in there, the bigger stuff first, then the smaller stuff, then the twigs. And then you put your topsoil back on there. You want to put some compost and wood chips on top. Um, you could use it that way. Um, yeah. Is there a friendly alternative to treated railroad ties other than rock walls in an edible garden? Yeah, um, you could just use logs. Like, yeah, we could use logs or uh, you don't even have to use borders, but if you wanted to use borders, um, lo logs are good um yeah um someone asked how your thoughts about southeast foraging by chris bennett all right that's a good one I, I i couldn't think of the name that's the one to get for foraging in the south thank you okay how do you deal with mosquitoes and deer right oh good oh, okay all right so first Hi. thing um mosquitoes are the in the first stages of succession to a pond ecosystem and oftentimes you know we find them in bucket lids and all those things um, so you just allow succession to happen is the first thing if you're building a, an actual pond if it's going to hold water 
Uh, you could you introduce fish if you want to, just go to the pet store and buy some fish. And you could even have like a stock tank with little minnows or whatever in there and put them in. Say you have horse and you have a water trough, you put some little minnows in there, eat the mosquito larvae. Um, and then uh, with deer, all right, so there's a, there's a principle in permaculture, another one called planned redundancy. So m doing multiple things. Um, there's like motion sensor sprinklers you can set up uh, and you can put them on a timer so that they're not like hitting you when you're leaving your house or something. Uh, and there's a, uh, uh, like some organic, like, like clove and cayenne and garlic and all these different things that you can put out and put into your plants. Uh, and then of course there's fences, uh, high fences. And then there's like, you know, you can have like six foot fences don't, don't have to be too high, but you have them close together or five foot fences and a deer is not going to want to jump into like a small space. So see that and not want to jump in there. And then you could have like chickens in that little moat. You have a chicken moat. <laughs> so I have an upset three months old. Um, I heard you, well, I get your principle about not really messing with the deer and using fish to naturally combat the mosquitoes are you opposed to mosquito dunks to use for Just, um if they're necessary uh, that's fine, but use biological methods first then that would be my go-to but you know do what's necessary um but trying not to you know try and be conscious of what you're putting in your water and because that's going to be going into everything else around there, so. Well, um, I just got two more questions in the chat. One is, is there any way to integrate a dog into a permaculture system? Yes. Um, so there are dog friendly landscapes first. Uh, um, I have to think about that one. I don't really come across that too much. Um, we have livestock guardian dogs. Um, yeah, there there are ways. I'm is I don't I can't think of any right now. Sorry. <laughs> More than me. No, How do you no. find a good permaculture certification program? Google. Um, there's a the people that I'm taking oh, that I took mine from uh, Cliff and Jen at Spiral Ridge. They're not teaching permaculture anymore. Um, they had an awesome living course. Uh, there's a dude named Alan Booker. Um, he's in Huntsville, and that guy is one of the smartest people I've ever met, um, highly recommended. Um, and he's like flown out to all over the country to teach. Yeah, so just just look it up. I'm not, I don't know of any right around here other than high school. That was the last question I had, but Jeannie Malone did say that mosquito dunks are biological and safe for fish and birds. And I just Rock asked on. about that because um, Jefferson County Stormwater, they actually provide mosquito dunks for this, like for residents for free. So if you ever come to any of their events and even some of our in-person events, you can always ask us ask us for mosquito dunks for your standing water in your yard to kind of help with that. Um, so those are all the questions. Thank you so much to, for this today, Trevor. Um, I really appreciate it. I'm sure everyone really appreciate it and people always want to learn more about permaculture and edible landscapes. So this was a great presentation. Thank you. Appreciate y'all for having me. All Thanks right. everyone.
All right. And thanks, Tyler, for being our host today with Alabama Cooperative Extension. Um, I'm not sure if everyone has met him yet, but he's one of our new extension agents at the garden. So if you have any questions or I think mostly about um, vegetable gardening, right, Tyler? Yep, and aspects of urban agriculture as well as um, natural resources. So feel free to reach out to Tyler. He's on site. You can email him or contact him if you have any more questions. And we hope y'all have a wonderful rest of your day. Thanks, everyone.